Welcome aboard uh, the weekly Mac Forum video chat. Uh, we're getting started right on time this evening. Uh, I got one eye on the uh, screen here and one eye on the uh, Cowboy Packer game. Uh, so you'll excuse me if I'm a bit distracted here for a minute. Looks like we're headed for overtime in that one. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll try to focus my attention on what we got going on here. And I'll catch the end of the game after uh, afterwards. Uh, first of all, I want to begin by welcoming our newest member. It looks like it's uh, Vorpike. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, and as usual, I want to welcome all of our members. And to those of you who have not yet become members, uh, that's the best way to uh, get a question answered. Uh, don't try posting them in the Contact Us forum. Uh, very few people see that. Uh, that that uh, area of the forum is strictly for moderators and administrators to deal with uh, forum-related issues. So go ahead and become a member and join the fun and uh, find uh, dig into the wealth of information that's available. Uh, as an example, let's take a look at one of the things that, that's come up here. Uh, as you can see from the screen, uh, member Peter Nasher. Uh, is having some issues with a 27-inch uh, 5K Retina iMac. And it, it's essentially stalling during startup. Startup's taking longer than it really should. Um, and we haven't fully resolved this issue yet for him. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get some more feedback on some of our suggestions. But one of the thing, the reason that I brought this uh, thread up for the show tonight is that uh, Peter is running a, a cybersecurity app and a, a cleanup app. Now, if you've been around the forum for a while, you know that most of us avoid these uh, cybersecurity apps, these virus checkers and other type things. And, and we also tend to avoid most of the cleanup applications uh, because they can uh, at times be a little overzealous in what they, what they clean up. But let's for a moment assume, uh, and uh, Peter did mention that the cybersecurity app uh, flagged three or four things. I suspect that these are uh, Windows uh, malware things that uh, would have no effect on his Mac. But uh, let's assume for a moment that for whatever reason someone needed to run um, these cybersecurity type applications. And, and maybe some of the cleanup applications. Uh, there's something I want to point out uh, about those applications. And, and the same is true on the Windows side, which is where I'm most familiar with this. Um, the particular application in question seems, cleanup application seems to have some of the same functions as the cyber uh, security application. And generally speaking, you don't want two of these types of utilities doing the same function. Uh, they're going to uh, almost always uh, get into conflict with each other, uh, contradict each other, uh, or in some cases cause a massive amount of uh, slowdown uh, when you have both of these running. Uh, my suggestion to Peter is to try creating a second user account. Don't let either of these applications load in that account and try restarting using that second account. Uh, do that to see if it cleans up the performance issue you're having. If it is, if it does clean that up, then you have a suggestion that one or both of these programs may be the culprit and you can then proceed to make an informed decision about which ones, if any, you want to keep. Uh, but that's a good way to do that because you're starting with a clean account uh, as long as you don't let either one of these, um, uh, either one of these things uh, load during startup. I haven't put all of that in the thread yet, uh, but I'm going to. I, I, I put in the suggestion about uh, starting with a new account. So we'll see how that goes. Um, all right. That was one of the things that came up in the, uh, forum related information, uh, this week. Uh, there are other good forum threads 
several uh, involving things that we've discussed before. So I'm going to move into some other issues and tips. And a lot of these are iOS tips tonight instead of the usual mix of Mac and iOS tips. Uh, this first one has to do with adding favorites to the Apple Maps in iOS 10. Uh, I know that not everybody is fond of the map application in iOS 10. Uh, for me and the limited amount of times that I need it and not needing uh, mass transit info, uh, it works pretty well for what I need it to do. Uh, and the ability to add favorites to it uh, can really cut down on the, uh, the amount of punching around that you have to do. If there are places that you go to, uh, but you don't often, you know, you don't go there very often, uh, that's a good candidate because you don't want to have to retype that every time. You don't have the directions memorized and you don't want to have to retype it every time. So you go to the same place, but you don't, you don't go very often. Uh, normally you'd have to retype it, but here's what you can do. First of all, find a place that you uh, wanted to go to, that you want to go to. And uh, this is uh, this article from iPhone Life. Uh, Jim Carpen, who's the author, picked the Statue of Liberty as the place that he would go to. Uh, and so then the next thing, after you've picked that, identified the landmark, now you've got it loaded. As you can see, something similar to the screen that you see here. Swipe upward on the information card until you reach the very bottom. So as you swipe up, you're going to see something like what you see here, uh, the information card. Now, the next thing you're going to want to do is tap add to favorite. Okay. Because what, and then what that's going to do is add that particular card to your favorites. And when you, the next time you get ready to use the map application, you have easy access to that, that favorite and any others that you've created. Uh, to get access to your favorites, you swipe up on the search field. So you're going to go to this search field right up here and swipe upward. Okay. And this shows you your recent locations that you've used. Uh, you can then scroll down to the bottom and tap favorites and your list of favorites will open. If you tap on a favorite and then choose directions and go, you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll bring up a set of directions. Uh, I use this quite a bit. Uh, we, uh, occasionally will go, uh, to a city nearby that we don't travel to very often. And there are a couple places that we go that it's just easier to have the directions, uh, on my phone than the, to remember where they are. And the thing that you have to be careful of is um, I found I like maps for, for that purposes, except for one tiny little uh, quirk that seems to be unique to certain places that I visit. Um, the directions that maps give me going to this particular location are pretty accurate and they get you there in one of the easiest routes possible. On the way home, on the return route, rather than uh, basically retracing your steps, it takes you out a different route that uh, neither my wife or I particularly like uh, traveling. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where it doesn't always do exactly what you want to do. And you have to be aware of that. Um, I think I can force it to give me that retrace. Uh, I just haven't tried it yet. It, it, it happened once or twice before I realized that uh, it wasn't taking us back uh, through the same direction that it, that it had uh, when it brought us in. Okay. Uh, so take a look at that. If you use maps a lot, you're going to find that a very helpful thing. Uh, or if you haven't been using maps because of the need to enter in uh, locations, go ahead and, and try this. Uh, build up a list of favorites and see how well it works. Um, 
Another one, uh, this, once again, comes from my phone life this week. Spent a little bit of time over there. Uh, Connor, Connor Carey over at uh, iPhone Life as how to listen to free radio stations and Apple Music without a subscription. Uh, there are some that you will be able to listen to. First of all, you want to start by opening the music app, tap on the radio tab at the bottom of the screen, and you can select one of the featured shows and it'll begin to play. Or if you tap either Beats 1 or, record, uh, or radio stations, you can play what's live on Beats 1 or select a radio station from the various uh, genres of, of content that's available. Okay? Uh, and that's a pretty good uh, uh, tip. I had not tried that yet. I haven't been using the um, uh, music uh, function on iOS because, uh, to be honest with you, during the day when I'm out and about, I don't really have uh, time to have the music handy and available. In fact, I've recently uh, cut back a little bit on my uh, data allocation because I was I was paying for more uh, data than I was using by a long shot. Uh, so we really don't use that a lot right now. Uh, I may use it a little bit more when I'm at home uh, and can access through Wi-Fi, but I haven't started experimenting with that one. So you might uh, give that tip a try and see what, see what you think of it. Uh, also from iPhone Life this week, uh, once again, another Connor uh, Carey uh, article. And it deals with some issues about Netflix, downloading and watching Netflix offline on an iPad or iPhone. Now, uh, some of you, if you've been following the show the last couple of weeks, you know that I uh, recently started uh, a Netflix subscription to uh, check that site out a little bit. And they have started allowing uh, offline viewing of some of their content. Now, first of all, keep in mind, this does not apply to all of their content. Right now, not all of it is available for offline viewing. That appears to be a licensing issue as some kinks get worked out with the content providers. But uh, what is available uh, may come in handy for you if, for example, let's say, for example, you're about to get on a plane uh, and you want to download something uh, while, you're, while you have a good Wi-Fi signal and then watch it uh, on a plane or maybe in a hotel room where your, your signal will be a little more iffy sometimes. Um, one of the things that you need to be sure to do is either download or update the Netflix app and then when you get that done, open the app and you'll see the, the uh, screenshot similar to uh, these. And the, uh, it'll show you, if you tap on available to download, it will show you uh, the movie, uh, find a show that you want to download for offline viewing, and tap on it. And it's as simple as that. Now, you do have to be aware of a couple of things. First of all, uh, generally there are time limits on some of these downloads. In other words, the, much like in the uh, iTunes store, uh, when you download something, uh, you've got a, a limited amount of time to uh, view it, and you want to, uh, to be aware of that, be cognizant of that. In other words, don't load yourself up with so much stuff that you can't possibly Watch it all in the in the amount of time that you have available. A um, couple of things, couple of other things. Now, what you can do if you get stuck and you get yourself in a little bit of a bind, one of the fixes for that. Let's say you've got something you haven't watched and your time has run out. Go ahead and delete it from your device and then re-download it uh, when you have uh, access to a good signal. Uh, I know that's a kind of a drastic approach, but it does get you uh, through, you know, that little hurdle. Uh, the directions in this article are pretty straightforward. I think you'll enjoy it uh, trying this. There are some things that you cannot download. Uh, as I say, it's a licensing issue. Uh, it goes through, the article goes through how to delete things that you finished watching, uh, that kind of thing. 
And of course, it's things like this that have pushed uh, iOS devices to the point that the current lineup, uh, the newest of the devices, start with a 32 gigabyte uh, storage amount. Because to be honest with you, even though I don't keep a lot of content on my phone, uh, I've caught myself a couple of times having to delete a few apps to clear enough space to uh, download the iOS update, um, particularly on my iPad, where I have uh, some things on there that I use that are not on my phone. So um, it's things like this and this proliferation of downloadable content and people being more comfortable downloading content that have, I think, pushed the development uh, to the point that now the minimal uh, storage space is 32 gigabyte on the new new devices. So that's a good one to keep in mind for Netflix. Um, and then I got a couple here, a couple of things here from Kirk, the iTunes guy. Uh, you know, that's one of my favorite places to visit Kirk McLaren, either through his website or through uh, his columns on Macworld. And um, Kirk, one of the things that he mentions is, and this is a tip that I did not know because, uh, I, as I say, I haven't been using Apple Music. He, uh, a reader asked about how, let's suppose that you're listening to something in Apple Music, but instead of streaming it, you decide, hey, this is good. I want to own this. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I'm, I'm a little old school. When I find something that I think I'm going to play regularly, I'll go ahead and buy it. I just, that, that's just me. Uh, okay, I'm old. Okay, I'm a fossil. Let's, let's get over it. You guys knew that. Okay, so here's what you can do. Um, if you are listening to something and you decide that you want to do, uh, to download this, to own it, Okay, if you right click on the track while you're in, in iTunes, as you can see from this menu, you'll see a contextual menu and you can choose go to and it'll show you one of your go to options is song in the iTunes store. So you right click on it and it's going to take you to this one of these menu options. When you get to go to one of your choices is song in the iTunes store. When you click that one. It's going to go to the iTunes store and find that song for you. Now, there isn't a good way to do that yet on iOS devices. You, uh, that option is not really there yet. The, the workaround that Kirk suggested is to uh, basically create a playlist for the music that you want to buy. Create that playlist on your iOS device. When you sync that playlist back to your Mac, then you can use your Mac to go and track down the music that you want to listen to. Um, and um, one other thing I want to mention, this is just kind of a freebie. I had not put this one in the show notes. Um, if you um, have been ripping some of your CDs to iTunes, you may have noticed that sometimes you will hear a noise in a track a pop or a click that really shouldn't be there. And it's uh, oftentimes this is a digital artifact, particularly on older CDs. It, it can come from a scratch or something like that. Um, and, it, and it will often occur on the last track of a CD. That's a track that's on the generally on the outermost rim of the CD. And that's the area, if you look at some of your, your CDs, you'll see the, the, it seems that the outer edges seem to be the one where it's most susceptible to scratching. Uh, different uh, CD drives have different ways of handling this. Sometimes tracks that are affected by this will be uh, play fine in a standard CD player because of the error correction involved. So uh, one of the things that Kirk mentioned that you can try is if you're using iTunes to rip that CD, go in and use error correction. Turn on the use error correction setting. And this is in iTunes uh, preferences in the general area. Okay. And uh, that will help you it, it, with some of this uh, problem. 
it may not cure at all. I've had some CDs that I could not, that I literally could not read. Uh, the finder would not read the whole CD. Nothing would read it because they were so badly scratched. But for minor scratches, this may get you by. All right, and uh, last one in our tip section is another one from our good buddy, Kirk McLaren. Uh, Kirk, the iTunes guy. Uh, this column, it's one of his iTunes columns, talks about the uh, limits on the number of songs you can have in, uh, in iTunes Match. But the, the, the tip that I wanted to point to, and, the, and the, this article covers both tips, so you'll get a freebie here. But the one that I wanted to be sure I mentioned to people is this one. He got a question from a reader who wanting to wanting to know if they could gift something to someone on iTunes if it's available in one country but not available in their country. Uh, and as Kirk points out, the answer is no. You also can't send a gift of anything to someone in another country due to licensing restrictions. Okay? Um, these rules may be a little different for some content than others, but it, it, it's strictly a, a licensing issue for the most part. Uh, I ran into that a few years ago with uh, a coworker who had bought uh, a couple of iTunes cards with the intention of giving them to someone outside the United States. After they purchased them, they found out that that wasn't going to work. The cards that they had purchased were U.S., and so I ended up uh, buying those off of her, um, and uh, that was the first time I had encountered that. But it does not surprise me, given the kinds of uh, restrictions that um, the these content restrictions put up from from city, you know, country to country. It's one of those things that you just sort of have to deal with. Um, and until somebody comes up with a better solution, you're, you're, you're kind of stuck with uh, these licensing restrictions as they are. Uh, so you may find, and I've mentioned before, um, I want to point out, we did have a, a user uh, this week who had some issues with uh, some tracks uh, we still haven't tracked this down as to what exactly caused it to get mangled, but it looks like um, some of their iTunes library got messed up. Uh, I want to point out, really, I can't possibly emphasize to you, particularly with iTunes, how important it is to keep a backup copy of the um, library. I have had to rebuild my iTunes library a couple of times because of, uh, in one case, because of a drive failure on a NAS, uh, network storage, for those of you that don't know that acronym. And in one case, it may well have been something that uh, I had done uh, and done incorrectly. And the, the, the library was a mess with duplicates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in either case, having to clean that up without a backup would have been uh, almost impossible. As it was, it was a little bit difficult. In the case of the NAS crash, uh, one of the things that I discovered was um, about that same time, a friend of mine who used to be a lifelong window user and now has switched to Mac told me that, uh, he said, why don't you just go in and re-download your purchases? Well, because at that time, that was when Apple first started that, and I really, to be honest with you, had lost track of the fact that you could do that. But even with that as a backup, okay, first of all, that doesn't cover everything. That, that covers what you've purchased through the iTunes store and it may cover some th some other things, but one problem that I encountered uh, was I had downloaded an album, and when I went to download that particular album again, only a handful of the 25 or 30 or so tracks that were in the album, I knew there were that many tracks, only a handful of them were in the iTunes store. 
And uh, just from some poking around that I did on the internet and, and asking a few questions on the forum, it seems like what happened is that the the missing tracks had gotten pulled because of licensing disagreements. Apparently that happens uh, a little more often sometimes than we as users would like. So don't depend on that download uh, function. It's a, it's a handy thing to have, but don't count on that as your backup. Uh, if for no other reason than if you had to download, let's, let's assume for a moment that your entire iTunes library were available for re-download. Okay. Let's just assume that every track you have in your iTunes library were available to be re-downloaded. I still would not count on that as a backup, uh, because of two things. One, uh, you're going to eat a decent amount of bandwidth. And for some of you, that's going to be an issue in terms of cost. And for two, if you have a large, large number of tracks, okay, it's time consuming. And then the third uh, possibility here, when you start to download all of this stuff at one time, um, I know I've encountered this before. The last time I re-downloaded some tracks from the iTunes store, I ran into an interesting problem. I, I can't attribute it to Apple. I don't know what was causing it. But several of the tracks I had to re-download multiple times before I got the full uh, album. I don't know if it was a function of how busy Apple's servers were, or whether our uh, internet connection was a bit unstable. I can tell you that, that, that our personal connection to the internet was stable for other things like web surfing. But I have had situations before where a connection that was stable enough to surf the web was not great when it came to things like downloading uh, large amounts of content. So do, as always, make a backup. If it's important to you, have a backup, regardless to whether you choose some type of cloning application, whether you use Time Machine, however you do it, uh, make a backup of your important stuff. All right, guys, that's going to just about do it for me this week. I know it's a little bit short. Uh, I uh, got a little bit of a late start on the show this week. Hopefully you found the information that I've given you uh, really helpful. And uh, until next week, I've been uh, happy to be able to bring this information to you. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I will see you next week in the forum on, uh, on the video chat and during the forum. Uh, you'll see me during the week uh, as Sly Dude. And so uh, keep a lookout for me there. Uh, ask any questions that you might have, or if you've got a suggestion for the show, feel free to post that in the show thread. And until next week, I'll see you guys.